Nobody has more respect for women than I do. Nobody. Hillary Clinton wants to abolish it, believe me. She wants to abolish our Second Amendment. I think they didn't deny it. I don't think anybody denied it. Other presidents did not call, did write letters, and some presidents didn't do anything. Many people have come out and said, I'm right. You really do have to ask yourself, where does it stop? Hello and welcome to Fallacious Trump, the podcast where we use the insane ramblings of an orange lump of lawyer kryptonite to explain logical fallacies. I'm your host, Jim. And I'm your other host, Mark. A logical fallacy is an error in reasoning that results in bad or invalid arguments. And the logical fallacy we're looking at this week is failing Occam's razor, also known as far-fetched hypothesis. I say we, but I'm going to have to leave you in the capable hands of Jim flying solo with the help from one or two others in a have I got news for you kind of way for the next several episodes. The work I'm currently doing means there'd be a conflict of policies in doing this, especially at the moment. But I'll be back to join in the fun again when this period is over. Meanwhile, then, I'll hand you back over to Jim to explain failing Occam's Razor. So we've talked about Occam's Razor on the show before, and we've talked about it a lot on our kind of companion show for patrons, uh, our QAnon book club. But basically, it's the idea that where you have two uh, possibilities, two explanations for something that do a an equally good job of explaining it and one of them requires you to make a certain number of assumptions and the other doesn't then the simplest explanation the the one that requires the least assumptions is more likely to be the right one now it's absolutely not a hard and fast rule sometimes the uh, the real answer to something the real explanation is a bit more complicated. It's not always the simplest answer. But it's about the smallest number of new assumptions that you need to make. So often that means that it is the simplest answer. It means that it's the most obvious answer in some cases. And what people are doing when they are committing the fallacy of failing Occam's razor is they are coming up with a a far-fetched hypothesis, a a ridiculous or unlikely um, answer for something and ignoring the obvious one. They're, they are just refusing to accept the simple, easy answer that doesn't require lots of other things to be going on that you don't have any evidence for or any proof for. Our first example this week uh, comes from a tweet that Trump sent when he had a Twitter account, which uh, was on the 4th of November, and he said, How come every time they count mail-in ballot dumps, they are so devastating in their percentage and power of destruction. So what Trump is doing here is he's ignoring the reason that mail-in ballots favoured Biden. He's implying that there is something untoward about it, and he went on to to outright claim that there was multiple times and is still doing so. But what he's doing is is he's forgetting, or he's pretending that the obvious answer, which is that he spent months telling people that mail-in ballots were bad and so all the people who trust him and believed what he had to say didn't use mail-in balloting and all of the Democrats who don't listen to anything he says, don't trust anything he says, did mail-in balloting because we're in a fucking pandemic and that's the safest way to do it. So obviously any child could tell you that the mail-in ballots were always going to favour Biden. And and everyone said it before the election, and it, this was always obviously what was going to happen. So by ignoring that absolutely obvious connection <laughs> between everything he said in the months running up to the election and the result that it inevitably caused, he's failing Occam's razor. And obviously he's doing it in a disingenuous way. I don't, I don't believe that he actually doesn't understand the link it's possible maybe he is just that stupid but i think that this was always part of his plan he he was always telling people to vote in person and not do the mail-in balloting um so that he could claim that such an overwhelming percentage of the mail-in ballot going for biden was very suspicious so our second example in this section is on the same theme, but it's not actually from Trump. It's from Lou Dobbs on Fox, whose show has now been cancelled because he kept making claims about um, Dominion voting machines and other things that might get Fox sued. And Fox have been sued by Dominion and Smartmatic. So Fox have now cancelled Lou Dobbs's show. 
And at the beginning of January, he made this statement. Eight weeks from the election, and we still don't have verifiable, tangible support for uh, the uh, for the the crimes that everyone knows were committed. That is defrauding uh, other uh, citizens who voted uh, with fraudulent votes. We know that's the case in Nevada. We know it's the case in Pennsylvania and a number of other states. But we have had a devil of a time uh, finding actual proof. Lou got so close in that segment to actually getting it, actually understanding why there isn't any proof. He, he just needs that little extra push. Maybe the reason that it's been so difficult to find any proof is because there isn't any proof to be found. Uh, but no, he wasn't going to go with that. So he is ignoring that as a possibility. He's he is saying, look, this is you know we we've looked so hard, we've done all this work, we're 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 eight weeks in, you know, we've had all these court cases, we've done, we you know, we've done such a lot, and still we can't find any proof. He just doesn't quite make the connection that the most obvious answer for that, the most simple answer, and the the answer that needs the the least additional assumptions is that um, the proof doesn't exist. And that's why we haven't been able to find any. There are many assumptions required to say that uh, Biden stole the election. You need to assume this um, kind of incredibly impressive uh, coordination by Democrats across the country. You need to assume widespread voter fraud that doesn't leave a a footprint that doesn't leave anything that can be pointed to in a way that would ever hold up in court. You have to believe in the way they are describing it, that there is such a brilliant infrastructure in this system that that they can find out how many votes are needed on the on election night and then somehow manufacture the the number of votes that they need in just the right states that they need them in, in a way that still leaves a paper trail that when Georgia recounts their votes by hand, it comes up with the same number as the machines came up with. So, the I mean, frankly, if a, if a political party could pull that off, then then maybe they should be the ones doing the governing because they're obviously the most organized and an influential and efficient political party in history because it's just it's a ridiculously complicated system to do that without leaving any evidence beyond people just claiming stuff um in in the face of everyone else saying yeah that's not true and lo- and judges saying you haven't presented us with any evidence of this actually happening so by completely ignoring the most obvious answers for these questions that they're asking both Trump and Lou Dobbs are uh, failing Occam's razor and now is the time i think for Mark's british politics corner mark found me a couple of lovely clips that kind of basically tell the same story and show the extent to which an alternative explanation has been suggested for uh, why so many people in the UK have contracted COVID and met so many people have died from it. The first clip comes from Good Morning Britain, where Piers Morgan is interviewing Therese Coffey, the Work and Pension Secretary. If, as you say, we've done all the right things, can you explain why we currently have the worst death rate in the world? And can you explain why we have one of the highest death tolls in the world? If we did everything right, how have we ended up here? Well, as I say, we've been learning throughout this process, working with scientific advisors on trying to take the appropriate policies. There'll be a variety of reasons why people, uh, unfortunately, have died due to this. Uh, Some of that will be recognising the uh, age of our population. Some of that will be recognising the obesity of our population. So are you saying that the reason for us having the worst death rate in the world is because of the public? They're too old and they're too fat. Um, I think that's a very insulting thing that you've just said. Uh, You just said uh, it. It's the public's fault, then, is it? We're too fat and nothing to do with the government. So, as Piers says, and and believe me, I hate agreeing with Piers (laughs) about anything, as usual, but, um, yeah, she is essentially saying that at least 
if not the only reason, among the main reasons that we should look to are the obesity or and the age of our population. And that that is really what is the important thing to think about rather than and, and or rather the explanation for for this rather than the idea that the government hasn't done enough. And this is a position that's been put forward for a while by the government. Uh, Baron McColl of Dulwich, who is a Tory, said in uh, September of 2020. The reason the high mortality in the UK is because the majority of the people are obese and the population is the densest in Europe and moreover is the travel hub of Europe. Blaming the government for the high mortality is therefore one of the most despicable allegations that I've heard in this pandemic. So Baron McCall thinks that blaming the government for the extent of the pandemic is is despicable um, because obviously it's about the obesity and the, the, so the, the population density in the UK. And that's why we have the most cases in uh, Europe. And it's just not true. Thanks to Mark for these figures. The um, NHS says that last year, 26% of UK men were obese or morbidly obese compared to 29% of women. So not the majority of people, as, as uh, Baron McCall said. And the population is certainly not the densest in Europe. As of 2016, the population density in England was 426 people per kilometre squared. The Netherlands has 505 people per kilometre squared. There are parts of Barcelona and Paris with over 50,000 people per square kilometre, compared to just 14,000 per square kilometre in Islington, which is London's most densely populated area. And yes, the UK is a, a European travel hub, but a hub is how you describe a place that people travel through to go elsewhere, often elsewhere in Europe. It's not a hub if people are coming to the UK, then it's a destination. And as a destination, the government has the ability to control the borders, as we were reminded uh, vociferously throughout the Brexit campaign. It's also within the power of the government to ensure that people transferring in the hub remain in the hub, and either no one gets to arrive, or if they do, they get tested and quarantined and retested, like in New Zealand, where they have had 2,320 total cases and only 25 deaths. So if we don't have a majority obese or aged population and the population is less densely packed than France, Spain or the Netherlands, why, if the government has done everything right, do we have a higher death toll than each of those countries? And the simplest and most obvious explanation for that is that the government hasn't actually done everything right. Who there, of course, with Can't Explain. In the Fallacy in the World, we like to talk about the fallacy of the week from a non-political perspective. And this week, our first example comes from The Simpsons. And this is an episode called Grandpa vs. Sexual Inadequacy. And basically, Grandpa Simpson has this kind of elixir that he sells to lots of people in Springfield that reinvigorates their sex lives. And so all the adults, therefore, are starting to go to bed early. And the kids are confused about this, understandably, because they don't know what's going on, and they come up with some interesting ideas. OK, it's now painfully clear. The adults are definitely paving the way for an invasion by the saucer people. You fool! Can't you see it's a massive government conspiracy? Or have they gotten to you, too? <laughs> Haven't you ever heard of Occam's razor? The simplest explanation is probably the correct one. So what's the simplest explanation? I don't know. Maybe they're all reverse vampires and they have to get home before dark. Ah! Reverse vampires! 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 Reverse vampires!
So Lisa tries her best here. But remember, Lisa is also a child. She doesn't know what's going on. She doesn't see the the people kissing in their bedroom and, and drawing the blinds in the early evening and make that connection. So she can't go all the way with this reasoning, but she does complain about the ridiculous hypotheses, the far-fetched hypothesis that, that Bart and Milhouse are coming up with. And this stream runs through the uh, the episode, and by the end they come up with this mega conspiracy that features all of the different ideas that the different kids have had. So, um, yeah, there is a simple explanation. If you if you look at it and, and you look at the context, you can see that without coming up with ridiculous ideas. Our second example comes from the drama series Brothers and Sisters, and this is an episode where Justin is at a party, uh, he is training to be a doctor, and he gets talking to a guy who is currently a doctor. You know, when I was an intern, a woman came in with a rash all over her body. Total mystery. Did a biopsy, gave her cortisone, thought she had some exotic melanoma. Well, did she? No. Turns out she was allergic to her laundry detergent. <laughs> Simplest explanation. And you hear hoofbeats. You think horses, not zebras. Mm. So that phrase of where you hear hoofbeats think horses, not zebras, is basically a rephrasing of Occam's razor. And it's something which, according to American TV at least, is a common thing that is told to medical students. I don't know if that's true, but it's it comes up in a lot of medical dramas uh, and people people saying it to their interns and things like that and and i do know that there is an a, an element of hypochondria that comes along with training to be a medic and you when, when you read about all of these different symptoms then you start imagining that you might have those symptoms and st- might have some you know every disease you learn about basically in some cases so i i wouldn't be at all surprised if it's a common thing that people start to look for more unusual causes for reasonably mundane symptoms once they start learning about all of the different diseases that they could possibly represent. So, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if the doctors who are doing the teaching regularly say things like that, you know, look at the most obvious answer, look at the the most simple um, reason that these symptoms might be occurring, rule those out, and then move on to more you know, unusual reasons that the the person might have these symptoms. And yeah, that that makes sense when you're diagnosing people, uh, unless obviously you work for Gregory House because it's always the more unusual things in that show. But yeah, when you're diagnosing people, you should obviously rule out the more obvious things first. But yeah, that also makes sense for general reasoning. If you're confused by something or, or you have a set of situations which might lead you in one particular direction or they might have a less likely, more exciting uh, cause, then, yeah, of course you should rule out, if you can, the, the more likely thing first. The, the more mundane, the simpler, the, uh, the reason which requires you to make less assumptions. And and that is using Occam's razor for uh, working out your logic and failing to do that leads you to committing a fallacy. So before we move on to fake news this week, I just want to tell you about a little fun thing that we've been doing on our YouTube channel that you might want to check out. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Basically, at Christmas, uh, we release the Ghosts Can't Do It episodes on our main feed and for patrons, we played a game on YouTube called No More Jockeys. It was Mark, me and a friend of Mark's called Ian and we just played this fun game basically over Zoom and we did three episodes for patrons which which are staying only for patrons. They're not being released but we enjoyed it. We had fun. So we thought, yeah, let's do this more often and so we're going to release one episode basically, one game Uh, every month on the first of the month so if you've ever wondered what mark or i look like or or just think that it might be fun to to watch us play a game check out our youtube channel Uh, i'll put a link to it in the show notes and at the same time maybe you discover a new game that you can play with your family or friends so we're gonna we're gonna play fake news folks i love the game it's a great game i understand the game as well as anybody 
as well as anybody. Yes, it's time for fake news, the game where I read out three Trump quotes, two of which are real and one I made up, and my guest has to figure out which one is fake news. And my guest this week is Marsh from the Merseyside Skeptic Society. Hello, yes, it's nice to come back. Excellent. We're, we're going to interview you in a little bit. We're going to ask plenty of questions, but, but we couldn't have you back on the show without playing fake news. So uh, I'm just going to give you three quotes, two of them are real, I made one up, you have to figure out which one it is. Simple as that. Perfect. There's a kind of a theme to these ones, which is that um, sometimes Trump just really couldn't quite decide what to call something. So he he gave lots of different options, basically, because he couldn't remember what things were called sometimes or what other people called them. So statement number one, even certain of the other side are starting to see the level of importance and the importance of having this wall. I call it a wall. Some people are liking to call it a barrier. And some people are even calling it slats, but it's a wall, and it's a strong wall. It's a powerful wall. Okay. Statement number two. I want to thank the White House Historical Association and all of the people that work so hard with Melania, with everybody, to keep this incredible house or building or whatever you want to call it, because there really is no name for it. It's special, and we keep it in tip-top shape. We call it sometimes tippy-top shape. Okay. Uh, number three. You can't really do better than MAGA. It was something we came up with, I came up with really, and it's just a tremendous logo. People call it a phrase, you can call it a campaign, I call it a logo, or a brand. It's like a brand, and it's just something that's been very, very successful. So I think there's a little bit of a clue here. Uh, I I could be wrong, because I think last time I was on the show, I was very confident explaining my logic (laughs) around something, was completely wrong about it. Um, But I think that third one is real because he's talking about how great the thing that he came up with is, the thing that he did was, uh, this whole MAGA thing, which I think is very much on brand for him. He, he loves to talk about stuff that uh, uh, he either he came up with or at least he can claim ownership of, even if it was other people who, come, who came up with it. And I assume it would have been other people who came up with it. So I think that third one's real. Okay. I think the first one's real because it's about his wall and he's done the wall, or, although he hasn't done the wall because the wall hasn't been done, but it's his wall. And so I, I think he's talked about that. And he loves to use words like powerful, stuff like that. So I think the one that's fake is uh, where he's, first of all, thanking somebody who uh, isn't directly related to him. So he's thanking the historical association. There's no way Trump likes history. <laughs> There's no way he's interested in the building. You know, the building, he didn't do it. The, the house itself, you know, the, the, I don't think he'd, he'd compliment it unless he was personally involved or, you know, he had his name on the firm that was building it. So I think it's that second one is fake. And also he doesn't like to talk about Melania as well. He doesn't really mention her very often. So I reckon that's the tell. So I'm going to go number two is fake. Okay, totally fair. So you think number one is real and uh, number one is real. Even certain of the other side uh, are starting to see the level of importance and, and the importance of Harry. This wall, I call it a wall. Some people are liking to call it a barrier, and some people are even calling it slats. Uh, but it's uh, it's a wall, and it's a strong wall. It's a powerful wall. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not a specially strong wall. It is definitely slats, really, rather than... It is than 100% anything. slats. It's, it's 100% slats. barely a barrier, really. Um, certainly not if you have a kind of uh, a reasonably simple power tool from Home Depot or something like that that you can cut through it with. Mm. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so you also thought that number three is real and number three i did think that is fake news <laughs> i'm afraid yeah that he i'm uh, shocked i'm stunned uh, to he my has, very call. <laughs> he has taken credit for coming up with maga which he almost certainly i mean reagan used maga may make america great again so he definitely didn't come up with it mm. but um but yes he he hasn't as far as i know called it a logo or done all of that stuff but, uh, but indeed, he did say number two. So I want to thank the White House Historical Association and all of the people that work so hard with Melania, with everybody, to keep this incredible house or building or whatever you want to call it, because there really is no name for it. It is special. And we keep it in tip-top shape. We call it sometimes tippy-top shape. The tippy top shape is what threw me. That did not sound like him at all. It's weird, isn't it? It's a weird phrase. In fact, that partly caused uh, QAnons um, and people who who kind of think there are hidden messages in stuff that Trump mm. says to to kind of investigate that and think that must mean something because what a weird thing to say. 
but yeah, he he says that from time to wow. time. He said it a few times. So there you go. And I I don't know why he kind of stumbled after saying house because it is a house. He's talking about the White House. So yeah, and he's often kind of he often does that where he'll say a word, stumble around it, and then make out like. Actually, the reason he was stumbling is because there actually is some uncertainty. Yeah. So we've got to explain that what everyone thinks is uncertainty, but actually I know it's not uncertain. It's actually this thing. It's I, I think it's a guy who um, isn't a strong reader, sight reading speeches. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so he, he's going to make mistakes constantly as he speaks, but rather than do the prep work of reading the speech ahead of time, because that, that would involve actual work, um, or getting better at sight reading and just covering on the fly, um, instead of doing either of those things, he just makes out like he was uh, infallible. Yeah, absolutely. He can't possibly admit that he's made a mistake. Um, so, <laughs> so unfortunately, that means you didn't get that correct. So, uh, so you're consistency still consistency is all I ask. Zero percent. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but yeah, you're welcome back anytime to see if you can get one of these right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So it's time for the part of the show that this week at least is called Marsh is Not a Logical Fallacy because, well, I've kind of spoiled the surprise already by, by doing fake news with you, but yes, it's Marsh from Merseyside Skeptics and Be Reasonable and Skeptics with a K and the Good Thinking Society and Skeptic Magazine and just, I mean, lots of different things. You'd yeah, You're busy. I like to be involved in lots of different projects. <laughs> it's fun to keep um, active and keep spread across lots of uh, lots of different things, really. Yeah. Uh, it's it's almost exactly two years since the last time you were on the show. Um, it's been pretty quiet, uneventful. <laughs> two years, isn't it? Not much gone on. Well, I mean, are you going to have to sort of pivot the show away from Trump? The, the the less we hear of him in future, you must have some sort of long term contingency plan for this happening, or were you just completely on the the MAGA train, assuming he? Oh yeah, get well, a I was term? desperately hoping he was going to get four more years. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, what I've been saying for the last few few weeks at least is that. I don't think he's really going anywhere. I mean, I don't, mm. obviously he's not in the White House anymore, but I, and I've been surprised at how quiet he's been since, since Biden's inauguration. But I, I think we're going to hear more from him. And I think there's every danger that his kids are going to run. And if he doesn't get convicted in the upcoming impeachment trial, then I wouldn't be surprised if he decided to run again in 2024. So well, yeah. yeah, I mean, I could certainly see him trying to run again, partly just for, for you know, complete hubris, not for any actual interest in doing the job or for having enjoyed having done the job no. for the last four years. But just I don't think he's enjoyed a minute of it, no. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a big, shiny thing, so it, it deserves to be his. Um, mm -hmm. But actually, I'm not, I would be less worried. I'd be sort of um, tentatively less worried should one of his uh, spawn run, because the thing about a cult of personality is it doesn't translate or transfer very well to another personality, especially an absence of personality. Yeah. Um, there's nobody else in his uh, family unit who uh, has the, the the charisma that he undoubtedly has charisma as, as loathsome as the individual he is he undoubtedly has charisma and that simply isn't true about don jr or eric or ivanka <laughs> no that's absolutely fair yeah i think there is some reflected glory somehow that, that the people who are absolutely all in on trump do seem to put them up on a similar kind of pedestal so well, we'll yeah, see. And I guess um, Jeb Bush ran on uh, on the Bush name, yeah, but um, yeah. it didn't get him that far, really. I mean, he, he got he got into uh, to power, but not to the presidency. Yeah, and there's talk of Trump starting a new uh, party or the people around him starting a new party, which I I can't see him doing unless it would absolutely be to to get him back into the White House. Which I mean, he'll do anything for that, I think. But if he's not on the ticket, I can't see him bothering really. Well, I could see him starting a new party purely because you can then start having things like um, political action care funds, you know, super PACs yeah. and things like that. Um, because essentially his entire second, the, the campaign run, a, a large part of this, the, the campaign run for the second uh, term was a uh, grift. I mean, I don't know whether you were signed up for the emails he was sending out on a, a <laughs> yeah, 15 I mean, a day. It was amazing. And the, and the um, I mean, just in the uh, fundraising after he lost the election, they, mm. It came out recently that they made eighty six million dollars. Um, yeah, yeah. Just just in that bit, and and spent very very little of it on campaigning to overturn the, the election results. So mm, yeah, yeah. No, the grift is um, is is constant with Trump. Um, but back to you. Um, <laughs> we talked last time about about be reasonable and good thinking society, but. Mm. 
I want to kind of go back to the beginning, your first kind of sceptical activism. Was that when you got involved with the, in, or started really, the, the Merseyside Skeptics Society? Or had you been doing stuff before that? No, so that was that was it really. So I, I came across um, things like sceptical podcasts a little bit before that. And once I'd listened to a few, I was uh, just Googling to see whether there was a sceptical group uh, in Liverpool where I live. And um, all that came up was uh, this chap on Meetup uh, asking the same question. And uh, I kind of resolved the next day to email him and say, you know, maybe we should start something. And, and it turns out he actually had started something that morning. Um, so that was kind of it out of nowhere. And that something was the, the Merseyside Skeptic Society, which we set up in February 2009. Um, and we ma mainly set it up primarily as a place for people to kind of come and hang out. But we always uh, had a bit of an activist mentality from the start. And the thing that I got really excited about early on in scepticism was finding out all of these things that I've never believed were true previously. So the idea you could talk to the dead or that alternative medicine is going to cure you from all these different things. Um, what excited me was once I came across scepticism, I realized that those ideas that aren't true also aren't precious or removed from reality in the sense that you can just go and experience them. You don't have to believe in them to experience them. Um, you can go along to a psychic show. You can go along to a mind, body, spirit festival and uh, and see firsthand the things that people claim to to be real and the things that they try and sell and the, and the, you know, the, the various predictions and prognostications they'll make. And so with that mentality, that's kind of the, 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 the thing that excited me most about skepticism, I think, early days, and still does even these days, really. And with that mentality, when we, uh, when we started the Merseyside Skeptic Society, I was looking out for things to do. And uh, one of the things I spotted was a, um, a book signing at the local Waterstones in the middle of uh, Liverpool city centre um, by a chap called Joe Power, who described himself as the psychic detective. Uh, who had appeared in the newspaper several different times talking about how he could, he'd could he seen the face of the man who abducted Madeleine McCann and it looked not unlike the police photo fit, is, uh, is what he said, which is a remarkable level of psychic acuity. <laughs> and he'd, he'd also done a seance with John Lennon and uh, got a message from John Lennon from beyond the grave. And John Lennon's message from beyond the grave was peace, which isn't the kind of thing you can just come up with <laughs> right, with a, yeah. a cursory no, I mean, knowledge uncanny. of John Lennon's back catalogue. You need that connection. And so I saw he was doing this book signing and I thought I'd go along and actually uh, take him an application form for the Million Dollar Challenge um, to see, knowing full well there's no way in the world he'd, he'd sign this form and apply to, to be part of what was at the time the James Randi Educational Foundation's challenge that if you had paranormal, claimed to have paranormal abilities in any way and could demonstrate them under test conditions, you'd get a million dollars. And the million dollars just sat in the bank out waiting to go to someone. Uh, and the whole time the challenge was open, Nobody passed the test, even though the t test was set at a very fair level that they themselves had to agree to first. And so I thought, he's not actually going to take that application. He's not going to take the application form. He's not going to take the challenge. But the idea was, instead, it wasn't re relying on him taking it. The idea was that I would stand in the queue with all of his fans, talking him up about how brilliant he is and how he's going to take this challenge. He's going to get the money. He's going to prove the doubters wrong. He's going to demonstrate once and for all that psychics are absolutely real. He's going to shut those, those uh, skeptics and scientists up. So by the time I get to the front and he refuses to take the challenge, maybe the people around me will think, well, why wouldn't he do that? Why wouldn't he take the money? Why wouldn't he prove this stuff? And maybe I could lead them to, uh, to question their faith in this guy. And, and this was a plan that I thought was absolutely foolproof. Um, but I, I overlooked one element of the plan, which is uh, I went there to this, uh, th this book signing. Nobody else did. It was just me oh, and wow. Joe. <laughs> so I expected there to be a queue I could grandstand to. Uh, and what I got was uh, Joe, Joe Power sat at a, a table forlornly signing copies of his book that were on the shelves for literally months later because I kept going in the shop and checking. Um, so, yeah, I didn't I, I did actually have a chance to, uh, to 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 give in the million dollar challenge application form outside the, the bookshop just after he left. Uh, but rather than it, it, I mean, this story is available online and it's it's one that I've told for many, many years. He uh, he took it and said, are you the one who's been writing about me? And I said, well, you know, I've written a bit about you, Joe. Yeah, because I, I don't think that you're psychic. But uh, if you take this challenge and prove that uh, psychic powers are real, I'll take down every page of the Merseyside Skeptic Society website and replace it with just a message saying your power is definitely psychic. But take the test first. And he said, the thing is about people like you is you sit in front of your computer till three o'clock in the morning, festering away, plotting to bring down people like me in exactly the same way that paedophiles plot to kidnap and rape children. Wow. 
um, which was a surprise because <laughs> he, he went to the paedophile card way too early. That's a schoolboy move. He's left himself nowhere to go. Um, but obviously what he was doing, he said it with a big smile on his face, very relaxed body language. And he was saying something abhorrent to me. So I would react angrily and viscerally to him um, so that anybody around would see him being what looked like a nice guy and me just sort of going off at him. And so I didn't do that. And I, and I carried the conversation on as kind of civilly as possible, uh, as you can from that kind of point. Is that that's a bit weird, George. Do paedophiles often write about how you haven't got psychic abilities and about how you <laughs> make things up for publicity? That's a strange thing for paedophiles specifically to do. Um, and then we left it and went our own ways. And a couple of days later, a report emerged online that on that day, your power had been attacked by a mob. And I read it and thought, I'm that mob. <laughs> they mean me. I'm not a mob. It's just me. You know, I was there with a mate of mine, but we're not a mob. Um, so yeah, I got into a, a very odd scrape with dual power, uh, early. That was, that would have been June, 2009. So about four months after we started the most skeptic society. And that was kind of, that was probably the first bit of kind of concrete skeptical activism. I'd say uh, I, I ever did really. Excellent. And, and how early on did you start the, the skeptics with a K podcast? I think that was August, 2009. So if I remember rightly, now the, the date a bit fuzzy because obviously it's, it's a while ago now, it turns mm, out. Sure. So yeah, we set up in February 2009. There was that Joe Power thing in June 2009. It might have been around about the same time, actually, because I think I definitely spoke about it at some point in the show. And I spoke about it on another podcast that was happening around about the same time. So it, it was somewhere between the June to August kind of area, maybe June, July, August, uh, that we set, uh, set Skeptics with a K up. Um, and then... In uh, the January of 2010 was the, the, the day we did the first 1023 campaign of homeopathic overdoses, um, where we had people all around the country in 13 cities across the country, 300 people go into their local boot store and buy some homeopathy and then all together stand outside of those boot stores and take a, a quote unquote overdose of those, uh, of those pills to demonstrate that there's nothing at all in homeopathy. And we had these all filmed and loads of pictures taken. And it was actually the, the front page story of the BBC News for the day. It, was, it made every national newspaper that we that skeptics stage this homeopathic overdose stunt to advertise the fact that we, we know because of the science that uh, homeopathy has got nothing at all in it. And that was, yeah, that was January 31st. So just shy of the first anniversary of the Merseyside Skeptic Society. We'd, uh, we'd done that and been in every newspaper in the country. And we'd all, I'd also had the, the Joe Power experience and uh, started our own podcast and things. So it all moved pretty quickly uh, early doors in that first year. Yeah, pretty good. So Skeptics with a case started off with you, Mike and Colin. Mm. And now it's, it's you, Mike and Alice. And yeah. I mean, you all have your different kind of specialisms, don't you, that you come to the the show with stories about each each episode if not necessarily specialisms then kind of interests i guess yeah areas um, of research. yeah and it's funny how the shows change really because when we first started the show me mike and Cole would bring like two stories each for an hour-long show so you were really kind of whipping through stories in like six minutes a story something like that um and these days with me mike and alice we only do two stories total per show which means one of us has an, an off week because we've ended up going essentially doing sort of 20 to 30 minute deep dives on, on a topic which is kind of strange to see how the show's kind of evolved in that way um which i, I think partly is, is due to it having gone for 12 years like if you, there's only so many times you can carry on doing the superficial layer of a story without it feeling repetitive like here's another psychic saying they can do this they can't you know here's another homeopath claiming there's something in their remedy there isn't and so we started really putting together what ends up being kind of original investigative work per show we kind of have a rule where we don't report on other people's works or where, where if someone else has done the investigation, we don't tend to pick that up because there's lots of people doing that. We tend to do our own kind of thing. And so Alice has got a, a, a biomedical background. She's a, a cellular biologist um, who spent a long time in cancer research. Now she works in HIV research. And so she's a, the, the, the real scientist of the group, the genuine mm -hmm. scientist of the group, but also the, the one who really has a, a solid grasp of, uh, of the biology side of it. Mike's a web developer, so he does a lot of stuff about sort of digital privacy issues. He's also, I, I'd argue he's one of the experts uh, anywhere on um, the actual literature around whether the placebo effect is as powerful as skeptics like to think it is and as pseudoscientists like to claim it is. Um, so he does a lot of stuff in those areas, amongst other kind of things. And I, I've gone through several different interests, I think. I, I used to do a lot of stuff on psychics, but there's a lot. There's kind of fewer psychics around these days or fewer psychics doing things these days. Um, and I've become much more interested in stuff like conspiracy theory and misinformation and how that propagates through social media and through the actual media. 
uh, and and really kind of I spend a long time looking at how the media works so we can to try and sort of encourage media literacy and also understand exactly how you question the stories that end up in the newspapers by understanding the processes by which they get there. So, um, yeah, we've all got our own sort of different interests, and I think they come together and complement each other reasonably well, really. Yeah. So one of the um, topics that you covered uh, a few months ago now on Skeptics with a K was QAnon and mm. the kind of the growth of the or the kind of move over into this country really of the QAnon kind of conspiracy theory and groups of people that actually believe it and go on marches and things like that about it mm. um do you see that stopping now that Trump is out or do you see that kind of taking on different forms what do you think is the likely course of that now yeah I don't see it stopping but I, I don't think it started. So I, I think that the QAnon movement is only the QAnon movement now because there was a person pretending to be Q saying things that the QAnon movement, what became the QAnon movement, could latch onto. But large parts of the QAnon movement were previously the Flat Earth movement, I think. There's quite a, a large overlap there. And certainly, if not an overlap in terms of direct people, like this person went from being a Flat Earther to a QAnoner, um, then there's certainly an overlap in in the people who would be recruited to it. So if you go back three, four years ago, um, maybe sort of 2018, 2017-ish, yeah, um, the average person who would be likely to be pulled into a conspiracy rabbit hole would have been, would have been pulled into the flat earth rabbit hole. And then largely through, I think, um, changes that were made by the tech platforms, um, not necessarily changes for the better, but changes to um, adjust the way their uh, their product works. Um, the The rabbit holes that led to flat earth started leading to other places instead the flat earth became very big on both facebook and youtube facebook through uh, the facebook pages the kind of authoritative push uh push kind of entities that would say i'm a page about this and if you want to follow me i'll give you all the news about this and for a long time facebook would prioritize uh, posts that came from a page into your newsfeed and even move people away from groups into pages specifically to try and push into the news kind of area try to become a, another news distributor and so news uh, news entities news publishers would set up on facebook and push in that kind of way and facebook would therefore private uh, would prioritize the way that uh, those entities would uh, would work but the downshot of that or the, the 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 downstream effect of that was pages that set up to promote bullshit if they had plenty of um, attention and engagement and, and page views, would fall into that prioritization engine and start being aggressively marketed by Facebook to people. Because all Facebook really cares about is keeping you watching, keeping you uh, on the page, rather, keeping you uh, uh, on their platform, clicking around and engage because they can sell that time as, as advertising. In, I think, 2018, maybe 2019, Facebook changed the things it would prioritize away from pages and towards groups. And so those massive flat earth pages disappeared and were deprioritized. But instead, Facebook started looking algorithmically for, for groups to promote. And one of the things it looked for was groups that were that were filled with engagement. If it's engaged, if it's a, a group filled with engagement, if we show this to people, get more people in the group, more people be engaged, more people clicking and liking and doing the things on our platform that make us money. And so groups that had high engagement which would be things like comments and likes, would have certain kind of um, certain attributes, certain markers. And QAnon groups really fulfilled a lot of those markers because yeah. you're going to get a lot, <laughs> of, a lot of engagement. Yeah, yeah, because if you believe that there is somebody sharing cryptic prognostications that you need to decode, the comments on each post are going to be filled with people decoding bits of it their own way. And then people arguing with them about how incorrect their decoding is. And actually my coding is correct. And so you end up with this very vociferous argument and an and agreement and group sleuthing. But all Facebook sees is there's a hell of a lot of engagement there. And so Facebook started actively marketing Q groups to people who believed in homeopathy or people who claimed who said they were vaccine hesitant or people who were following yoga instructors in yoga groups. Because if you were part of a new agey kind of thing, then maybe you also had leanings towards the same kind of communities that Q, uh, that Q satisfied. And so Facebook massively promoted QAnon. So I think Facebook's now onto that and realizes it and is, is aggressively trying to stamp down on QAnon. But again, it's doing it through very um, unsophisticated means. So we've seen, for example, the, the, the Facebook page of Cork Skeptics um, removed 
because they ha- they had a, a talk about how bullshit QAnon was. <laughs> and Facebook said, QAnon, bam, you're banned. Yeah. The, the irony being the people who promote QAnon these days aren't using the term QAnon on Facebook. They may be using the storm or they may be using, say, the children or they may be on the next thing or the next thing or the next thing. They'll keep changing to hide. And the people who want to point out why those ideas are wrong will need to use the terminology of those ideas and they'll keep being caught in the, the filter. So Facebook will start to trim down the, the QAnon stuff, but because Facebook ultimately is not going to start harming their bottom line, they're not going to do things that are bad for their uh, th- their income stream. That same pressure that led first to Flat Earth and then to QAnon is going to spill out into another thing. And I think the QAnon movement is going to morph into that, and there'll be some sort of evolution of the QAnon in, in probably multiple different directions. Some people moving away from it, but others becoming more hardcore and believing it and just wrapping it the next thing well you know joe biden actually is part of the deep is part of the deep state and part of the thing that uh, or is, is part of the QAnon movement as well and or maybe joe biden was replaced with a clone and that clone is actually doing the same work that trump was and q's now talking to the, there's lots of ways it can evolve or it might just cut off the rabbit hole so people don't start entering but they'll start entering the next bullshit thing we see because tech companies are simply not taking seriously their uh their responsibilities to stop the spread of misinformation and disinformation and until that tap is turned off, that water is going to spill somewhere. And to what extent do you think that those of us in the sceptical community can have any kind of impact on that kind of dynamic, those, those groups and, and the fringes of them? Obviously, we're not going to convince people or many people that it's not true if, they've, if they're deep into it. But what can we do? It's tricky. It's tricky because ultimately... The things that uh, that will help untangle this will be accountability at the tech platforms uh, and visibility of what the the, the main claims of, of the conspiracy theories uh, are, and, and visibility in a kind of uh, uh, a vaccinating kind of way that you get exposed to it first, um, disconnected from the, the the actual belief of it, and then when you, when you so you, you hear about the adrenochrome thing of QAnon before you ever know anything about too much about QAnon or meet a QAnoner. And because you hear how ridiculous the most in-depth part of their uh, their worldview is, you're inoculated against it kind of creeping up on you, I think. Um, so one of the things we can do is uh, make people aware that these are not good ideas and th- that these are, are untruths. But there's a downside to that too, because in debunking those untruths, we end up spreading those untruths because you have to tell people this thing isn't true. And to a certain degree, that's going to uh, amplify the message. Now, I, I don't fully believe in the backfire effect thing of somebody f- really believes in something, you prove, it, you prove it false and they'll believe even harder. I think a lot of that kind of hasn't uh, borne out in, uh, in replications in the psychology literature. But there is certainly a thing that if people have never heard of an idea and you say, hey, have you heard all these people believe this thing? It's not true. Some people will only hear the first half of that. I think, well, if lots of people believe in it, well, maybe not all of it's true, but some of it will be. So it's quite hard for us to do that as a community. Um, the places where it will really, it really does help is when you have pretty mainstream authoritative places explaining why this thing isn't true. That that tends to do quite well. I think that's uh, things like um, the BBC's misinformation uh, and disinformation uh, areas. So Mariana Spring and Mike Wendling and BBC Trending have done some really, really great work kind of uncovering this stuff in, in, a, in a youthful way. Um, and one of the things that skeptics and the skeptic community can do is act as kind of the um, scouts for that information. It's to go off and be the hundred or the thousand or the 10,000 eyes on the web looking for this stuff and bringing it to the attention of the people who can then uh, report on it in, in quite a high level and authoritative kind of way. So I think that is something we can do. Another thing we can do is look out for the people in our lives who may be at risk of falling down these rabbit holes. Um, and that might be at risk in terms of the ideas that they already believe in, or it might be at risk in terms of the personal circumstances that they're in. So I spent a long time looking at the flat earth community and, and the one thing that really stood out was how many of the people who came to believe in flat earth did so after suffering um, personal crises, uh, isolation, uh, events in their lives, which which upset the apple cart. They might have lost their job, a relationship broke down, maybe personal kind of tragedy even. Um, something that left them on their own or feeling cut off or feeling disconnected. And then they turned to the internet for uh, for information and for um, entertainment and for engagement and for friendship and found the Flat Earth community and started to believe from there. Um, so if there are people in your life who 
are showing signs of being disconnected in that kind of way, then finding ways to reconnect with them is is one of the things we can do to stop uh, the the recruitment centers of these uh, these radicalization engines. Um, but ultimately, the only thing that's really really going to stop the majority of this stuff is for the social media platforms and platforms like YouTube um, to be held account for the misinformation that they are spreading because they like to pretend that they are just a platform, but they are kind of content agnostic, that we just exist and people put content on YouTube and it's not for us to say whether it's good or bad. But that is absolute bullshit <laughs> um, because for one thing, we all, we can all imagine the kind of things you could try and put up on YouTube and YouTube would say, no, thank you. We don't want that on here. So they actually are making editorial decisions about what they will and won't host. Um, and they're also making editorial decisions about what they recommend to people because you finish a YouTube video and you see a series of things that are coming up next. And those things aren't just sequentially the next thing that was uploaded to YouTube. Those are things that YouTube has algorithmically decided you might be interested in and that recommending them to you could keep you on their platform for longer, which means they can sell more advertising, which means they can make their money because again, their entire bottom line is the more people using our site for the longest amount of time equals more money in advertising to us. So YouTube make editorial decisions and then back away from those to say, we're just a platform. You know, we aren't, we aren't the Daily Mail. We are the concept of paper, but they're not. They are making editorial publishing decisions and they need to be held accountable to the, the decisions that they're making and the ramifications of those decisions. Um, so I guess the, to, to bring that back to the skeptic community, the thing you can be doing is to lobby your local politician to take this seriously. Um, how effective that will be, I don't know, but um, that's the... That's the root of of having the those big tech platforms um, be accountable. That's a thing that turns off that, um, that that tap of misinformation at source. Yeah, and also as you said, engaging with people in your circle. If if your friends or family are starting to talk about these kinds of things as mm. with some kind of credulity to to talk to them, and I think people can listen to the to the be reasonable podcast for a a masterclass in how to talk to people who have weird beliefs and and outside of the mainstream beliefs and do it mm. without judgment and without anger but actually just kind of talk to them and question why they think this and what evidence they have for it and whether there might be other reasons for things than than the ones they're believing at the moment so yeah and i think the the lack of judgment is key um, because nobody changed their mind because they were judged. They changed their mind because somebody they appreciate and love and respect and have a, a rapport with and have a connection with raised questions about it and, and asked them questions about it and, and found some issues with it, but didn't present it in a way that felt like an attack. People, I think, don't really change their minds when they're attacked. They change their mind when they're given the space to do so without the um, the usual cost associated with a climb down. And related to that, I'm wondering, where, do you get pushback on Skeptics with a K from, from listeners who maybe are um, kind of agree with you about things like homeopathy, but have their own uh, thing that they believe that, that maybe isn't, they're not so sceptical about, that you then cover on the show and they're like, oh, no, I don't agree with that. Do you, um, does that yeah, come surprisingly up? Surprisingly, not really. Um, maybe we did to begin with, and maybe because we've been going for quite a while, there's there's enough of a back catalogue to what we what we think about stuff that people have kind of been filtered out over time. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, and also, I think a name like Skeptics with a K, it's pretty obvious where we stand on a lot of stuff. And, and I think um, the kinds of lots of the kind of things that we talk about, especially around particularly pseudoscientific ideas around health and, uh, and, and paranormal and things like that. I think they wouldn't be drawn to a skeptics podcast in the first place. Um, but things like conspiracy theory, I think uh, comes a bit closer uh, to, uh, to, to somebody who might listen to our show. And we get a, a little bit of pushback on that, not normally on kind of, the small scale conspiracies in, in the sense of, um, you know, Princess Diana being assassinated, J Jeffrey Epstein being killed, 9-11 being an inside job. We, we don't really get pushback on those. Um, but I think more um, around structural stuff uh, about how the media works and, and what that means about um, the, the stuff you consume and the thing that you therefore really believe and therefore influence your worldview in this area. When we start to deconstruct that, people can sometimes get quite resistant um, also, if we ever mention Jordan Peterson, people, a small number of people get very pissed off. Um, but if they really are massive fans of Jordan Peterson, I don't know why they're listening to a show that uh, debunks things like dietary bullshit and self-help guruism anyway. Fair enough. <laughs> Lastly, I guess I'd, I'd like to talk about QED 
because mm. um, part of what MSS does is a sceptical conference. Normally every year, unfortunately, you had to cancel it for 2020 for obvious reasons. What kind of planning can you do for the next one? Is Are there plans to have something happening in 2021, something virtual? Or, or what what stages are those thoughts? Yeah, are? well, I mean, we're always... we. There's never a point where we aren't planning the next QED. Um, and we're always just trying to figure out exactly how that works. And, you know, when we when we postponed the or, or when we kind of cancelled the 2020 event, we said we will be back in October 2021. And we said that um, with all the level of information we had at the time. Sure. Uh, and obviously, it's really, really hard to say, because right now we might be in a position where come August, the vast majority of people in this country are vaccinated and our vaccine's great. And there's very little kind of um, surge around there and everything might work. Well, equally, we might be in a place where that isn't true and people aren't still vaccinated, in which case it just wouldn't be possible. So any decision about, that we take around QED will be um, obviously heavily dependent on, uh, on on public health measures and, and the best available advice. Luckily, we won't be the first event in the country to have to deal with this, um, even chronologically. There'll be events before us. Uh, QED will not be the first mass event to take place in the UK. Um, <laughs> if it ever looks like it's going to be, we will not be first. You know, we'll we'll make sure we uh, postpone it. Um, but we're we're always looking at things that we can do, um, and whether that means doing something digital on the weekend, whether it means moving it to another day, to whether what what we can do is all up in the air at the moment. And um, luckily, we don't have to make that decision just yet. But at some point, uh, relatively soon, uh, we will. So we're keeping an eye on on what information we have and uh, and how things are looking really and in the meantime you've been organizing talks throughout the year and and last year online with uh, skeptics in the pub online yeah that was something that um we started in sort of mid march so it was something that uh, most of skeptic society were, were initially looking to do to move our skeptics to the events online and we also saw that glasgow were looking to do the same thing and edinburgh were looking to do the same thing and you know a few other places around the country and we realized most of the places in the country actually most of the skeptics of the pub groups in the country were were looking to do the same thing um so we all got together i think i remember posting in the the skeptic of the pub uh, organizer meetup group to say hey guys rather than us all having our own individual monthly thing why don't we all get together and have a weekly thing that we're all involved in putting on and it gets to be this nice kind of community effort. And I think that I think the first one would have been the start of April. And I think we've done a, a talk pretty much every week since then with people from all around the, the, the skeptical community of the UK coming together to put it on. And it's been a really, yeah, a really satisfying project to be involved in. It's been a really kind of uh, edifying project to be involved in because it's just shown how many people in the skeptical movement really care about what they're doing and really care about making a, a an event that people can come to and, and especially people who normally can't even get to a skeptics in the pub because we're in a pub which means you've got to be able to get to a pub and lots of people's uh lifestyle lots of people's uh abilities lots of people's physical needs uh, lots of people's um childcare needs um mean they can't manage to get to a pub which is entirely understandable so it's re been really nice to be able to put on an event that people who couldn't even normally get to a skeptics in the pub can now be part of quite regularly um and it's really nice to see just how many people there are um, in the, the, the UK sceptical movement who really get it and who really care about putting something on that's um, that's building something that's uh, that's welcoming to people that makes them feel like they're part of the of the community that doesn't put up barriers and doesn't uh, doesn't require you to sign up to a, a load of kind of um, uh, prior beliefs. It's just if you're here and uh, you're, you're part of the, the, the be nice to each other uh, style, then you can be part of this community. So it's been really, really lovely. Yeah, well, I, can, I can strongly recommend those events online. Uh, it's every Thursday, right? Yeah, every Thursday, 7 p.m. at uh, twitch.tv forward slash SITP. Excellent. And, um, and whenever the next QED is on, I'll be there. So um, where can people go to find out more about your work and with the uh, MSS? So uh, Merseyside Skeptic Society is uh, merseysideskeptics.org.uk or you can go, you can look at uh, Mersey Skeptics on Twitter or Facebook. Uh, and Merseyside Skeptics is also kind of the publisher of uh, The Skeptic uh, magazine, which I'm the editor of. And you can find that if you go to skeptic.org.uk. We put up uh, at least three stories a week, up to five uh, original pieces of skeptical, uh, skeptical writing uh, every week. Marsh, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. And finally, some things we really don't have time to talk about. Among the things that freshman congresswoman and trailer park Karen Marjorie Taylor Greene has endorsed or promoted are the following. 
9-11 was an inside job. The Sandy Hook, Parkland and Vegas shootings were staged. Hillary Clinton eats babies. Prominent Democrats should be executed. QAnon is worth listening to. Muslims don't belong in government. And the California wildfires were started by secret Jewish space lasers. So naturally enough, when Democrats voted to remove Green from the committees she was assigned to, a whole 11 Republicans agreed, which was fortunately more than enough to do the job. You can't really blame the 199 Republicans who voted to keep her in a position of power after her forcefully disavowing a couple of her batshit ideas by passively saying, I was allowed to believe things that weren't true. Meanwhile, 61 Republicans voted to oust Liz Cheney from her post as GOP conference chairwoman for the crime of thinking insurrection is bad. One GOP representative discovered new levels of cowardice, voting present in a secret ballot. With his usual tact, dignity and humility, Trump has quietly withdrawn his membership of the Screen Acting Guild. Clearly, he's mindful that the Guild has expressed concerns that his insurrection fermenting actions, and not to mention his frankly terrible acting in the part of Wounded Loser, might threaten the safety of journalists, many of whom are SAG-AFTRA members. No, no he didn't. What he did do was send a letter, no Twitter, remember, basically saying, you can't fire me, I quit, with the remarks, while I'm not familiar with your work, sag has been a key part of entertainment production since the 1930s. He continues, I'm very proud of my work on movies such as Home Alone 2, Zoolander and Wall Street Money Never Sleeps, and television shows, including The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and Saturday Night Live. He shouldn't be proud of any of his appearances in anything. He's shit. He continues, and of course, one of the most successful shows in television history, The Apprentice, to name just a few. Let's face it, there are only a few to name, and current chair of the union, Gabrielle Carteris, played Andrea in an actual one of the most successful TV shows of all time, Beverly Hills 90210. In response, Carteris and sag National Executive Director David White issued their own two-word statement, thank you. Grayson erudition from Real Artists 1, ranty failed talentless out-of-work orange windbag, nil. With Fox News cancelling Lou Dobbs, other right-wing cable news channels are running scared from lawsuits in pretty amazing ways. My Pillow Guy and Fat Higgins from Magnum PI Mike Lindell appeared on Newsmax to talk about cancel culture, but kept making unsubstantiated claims about Dominion, which caused the show host to shout him down and read out disclaimers before eventually walking off the set of his own show when Lindell wouldn't shut the fuck up. Meanwhile, One American News Network took money from Lindell to show a three-hour documentary and please imagine giant fucking scare quotes around that word, that Lindell had made himself about how the election was totally stolen and we can prove it. We won't, but we can, honest. In the spirit of not being sued by everyone, OAN started the show with a 90-second full-screen of text disclaimer which we'll link in the show notes, but which basically boils down to this is all bullshit, but Mike paid us to air it, so here you go. (laughs) Just when you thought the UK had cornered the market in profiteering from the pandemic, well, members of this government's I'll bond you billions in contracts you're not qualified to deliver in return for funding and supporting the next election. Chemocracy, anyway. Our tristic group of college kids, Philly fighting COVID, has just been fired by the city of Philadelphia. The company was originally a not-for-profit concern when 22-year-old Andre DeRoshins started 3D printing face shields for healthcare workers at the start of the pandemic and formed Philly Fighting COVID over the summer to run pop-up testing sites with his friends. On January 8th, in collaboration with city officials, the group opened Philadelphia's largest mass vaccination site and, smelling greenbacks, switched to a full-profit model. Boasting how they'd get very rich, they began charging health insurers and collecting personal data, though they say they haven't sold any of that. After the vaccination centre got overbooked with 85 and 90 year olds queuing up for hours only to be turned away, DeRoshin was later seen to take spare vaccine doses home and posted a Snapchat of himself administering a dose to one of his friends. He's not a qualified medic, by the way, and the recipient was in their 20s. City officials cancelled their contract with Philly Fights COVID on Monday, and Philadelphia Health Commissioner Dr. Thomas Farley told today, In retrospect, we wish we hadn't worked with that organisation. If only our governing officials had the decency to fess up to their mistakes and even resign. No, wait, we'd have no one left. In case you thought it was just the GOP members in D.C. who were awful, awful people, meet Stephen Huffman, an Ohio state senator and doctor, who recently asked if the higher incidence of COVID in, and I cannot be clear enough that I am directly quoting him here, the coloured population, end quote, is because they, quote, do not wash their hands as well as other groups, end quote. Holy fuck. Huffman was fired from his job as an ER doctor for the remarks, but his cousin Matt, the Ohio State Senate president, appointed him to chair the Senate Health Committee instead. 
Remember several dozen conspiracy theories ago when Trump was taking hydrochloroquine to protect himself against COVID, but then got it anyway? And because Trump had told us of the healing power of hydrochloroquine, well, it's a six-syllable word, so he's never actually said it. No one could get it anywhere, not even malaria or lupus sufferers who died without it because it had become a restricted drug. Well, Oklahoma State has a $2 million stockpile of the stuff and is, quote, working with the Department of Health to try and return it. Doubtless, the Department of Health are laughing up their PPE sleeves at the greed and avarice of Oklahoma, and are perhaps even now prescribing bleach or a powerful light taken internally as a cure for slavishly Trump-blind and exceedingly red-faced state officials. It's almost our favourite time of year again, impeachment. And a week ago, Trump's entire legal team quit, reportedly because they refused to focus the entire case on Trump's claim that he actually won the election. My hopes that Trump might defend himself were dashed pretty quickly by the news that he had hired new lawyers, who I'm sure will do a great job. Oh no, wait. They've filed their 14-page response brief and it starts by misspelling United States. They go on to simultaneously claim that it's too late to impeach him now he's out of office, and also that doing it so quickly infringes on Trump's rights, somehow. And it also contains a fantastic argument from legal ignorance in saying about Trump's election fraud claims, quote, insufficient evidence exists upon which a reasonable jurist could conclude that the 45th president's statements were accurate or not, and he therefore denies that they were false, end quote which, for those not fluent in tortured syntax, is basically saying you can't prove the election wasn't stolen, so it was. 64 court cases beg to differ. The grim week last week, the UK passed 100,000 people dead from COVID-19. That's more than would fill Wembley Stadium, about the capacity of the Melbourne Cricket Ground in Australia, or the Darrell K. Royal Texas Memorial Stadium in Austin, Texas. It's twice as many people as the Beatles played to in Shea Stadium. Boris said he and his government truly did everything they could. Well, no, they didn't. And if they did everything they could, and that were even remotely true, then obviously it wasn't good enough. And they are therefore not fit to be governing this country. Also, we shouldn't be allowing anyone to say, oh, give him a chance. He's doing his best. Boris is the prime minister, not a toddler failing a potty training. Either way, we're in the shit. So in that regard, an ordinary week in Britpole. So that's all the bad arguments and faulty reasoning we have time for this week. And I'd like to thank my guest presenter, Frank, and my special guest, Marsh. Make sure you check out every single one of his podcasts, which we'll link in the show notes. You'll also find a link there to last week's episode of the Sitcom Archive Deep Dive Overdrive podcast, because I was a guest. And so if you'd like to hear a kind of extended fallacy in the wild, where I talk about the various fallacies that appeared in the 70s British sitcom The Good Life, then head over to fallaciousTrump.com where you'll find the link. And if you hear Trump say something stupid and want to ask if it's a fallacy, our contact details are on the contact page. If you think we've used a fallacy ourselves, let us know. And if you've had a good time, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can support the show at patreon.com forward slash ftrump. Just like our newest patron, Brian, and our straw man level patrons, Kaz Tuhi, Mark Reiki, and Amber R. Buchanan. Thank you so much, everyone. We really appreciate your support. You can connect with those awesome people as well as us and other listeners in the Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Fallacious Trump. All music is by The Outbursts and was used with permission. So until next time on Fallacious Trump, we'll leave the last word to the Donald. That's right. Go home to mommy. Bye. Bye.